Tel Aviv. What do you mean tube? We're YouTube? going live now. We're going live. Okay, we are live now. We are live. Okay, hello. I warmly welcome you to our 42nd webinar by the Academy of Space Runner Science International. My name is Sabina Heinz and I'm the person responsible for our webinar series. Uh, on this 6th of June, we're going I'm... now. We are going now. Okay, we are live now. Now, uh, I have okay. to start Hello. again. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, As always. Webinar by me. Okay, I start again. My name Hello. is Hello. I'm the person. Uh, there's person some echo. Oh me. my God. Where uh, is it? On this 6th of June, we're going I'm... Live now. We are going live. Okay, we are live now. Okay. Wow. okay. I have to start again. I'm sorry. Okay, I start again. We have an echo. There's some echo. Oh my God. Well, on this 6th of June. Oh, maybe, uh, Franz, do you have maybe uh, your uh, audio on? Open somewhere. Okay, okay. Okay, fine. I, I start again. I'm sorry to everyone. Hello, I warmly welcome you again to our 42nd webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. My name is Sabina Heinz and I'm the person responsible for our webinar series. And on this 6th of June, I am really delighted that you have come to join us. We have people watching from Norway and uh, from other countries. And um, our today, today's special guest is Professor Franz Renz from the Leibniz University in Hanover. Hello, Franz. Welcome. Okay, <laughs> now you, you have to unmute you. Okay. Uh, our today's topic is uh, uh, of high interest uh, for our space experts. And um, the topic is uh, Red Green Sunset and other chemical mass stories. Uh, I also would like to welcome Adriano Ottino. Uh, he is uh, one of our vice presidents and um, our former president and uh, one of the founders of Space Science International. Hello, Adriano, welcome. Hello, Sabine. Hello, Franz. Very happy to be here and to have you, Franz, this, this evening. I'm very anxious, uh, uh, curious to, to watch your lecture and to uh, uh, to listen and to learn something more about uh, yes. uh, Mars, yeah. Okay. Um, before I give you the floor, uh, Franz, uh, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Um, I met Franz at uh, the Space Travel Days in New Brandenburg. Uh, there is, uh, that takes place uh, every year. Um, um, yeah, a conference and it's very familiar, very nice. And he was the first time there. And uh, I asked him to attend our webinar series to give a talk. And Franz uh, Renz is an Austrian and uh, got his first degree in mechanical engineering, uh, studies chemistry and obtained uh, his PhD at um, TU Vienna, at the Technical University in Vienna. And after a postdoc in Japan and uh, Germany, he obtained his habilitation in Mainz uh, at the Mainz University. And since 2008, he is a professor of inorganic coordination chemistry at Leibniz University in Hanover. He had several visiting professorships, such as Kass Dis. I don't know if I pronounce it well. You can correct me later on. Uh, in China, in Tsukuba, Yokohama, Tokyo, Todai, Japan, Japan and uh, is known for his contributions to the discovery of the SF least uh, Huxi and uh, Huxiest uh, effects in molecular magnetism. Um, in 2022, he was honored with a Dr. Uh, Honoris Causa. Uh, I wanted to ask you from which university? Can you unmute you, uh, Franz? Uh, okay, uh, you can, yeah. Uh, he's devoted to the element uh, iron and his favorite, uh, his favorite uh, molecule is water. His main research interests are in molecular switching and the study of terrestrial and extraterrestrial materials. Franz Renz is heeding the research and development of the mi miniaturized mass power spectrometer MIMOS or MIMOS, uh, of which three are on the surface of planet Mars. Wow. 
He is member of the NASA Mars Exploration Rover Missions, Spirit and Opportunity, and currently his group builds devices for first space missions, uh, among them to the moon. Franz, uh, the stage is yours, but before I give you the floor, I would like to introduce Bernard Foyne. Hello, Bernard. He is our yes. president. Uh, yes. Hello. So thank welcome. You. Thank you very much and uh, uh, welcome, uh, Franz. It's a really a pleasure to, uh, uh, to hear you and to welcome you on the Space Renaissance uh, webinar. Uh, I'm just uh, here um, in Vienna, the beautiful Wien, where we have at the present uh, the meeting of the committee for new peaceful use of outer space, where we have been uh, presenting uh, some statements. Uh, as today, for instance, we presented in front of the whole assembly a st statement about space for all. And uh, as a 18 sustainable development goals, we have also a number of presentations on our program uh, of uh, training researchers, training astronauts, entrepreneurs, and artists. So that will be presented. I, I am preparing something for um, Wednesday. So it's a great city where a number of delegations from all countries are there, but also uh, NGOs. And so um, the meeting is finished. And of course, uh, we take the advantage also to explore the beautiful uh, Vienna, including uh, the Music Verein. You know, that's the place where uh, we had uh, the New Year's concert uh, every year. <laughs> and so we try also to um, mix up opportunities for uh, humanities, arts, together with the exploration of space. So we're really looking forward also to, to hear your talks on the technology development and the science you have developed uh, to know more about the moon, Mars, and beyond the Earth. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if we can stall just a few more seconds, uh, please. Yes, okay. Bernard, how did the assembly react to the, the, the presentation made by, by Carlton Johnson of the NSS yes. of the AG yes. proposal? Yes, so we, we prepared the joint statement and uh, actually, uh, you know, a lot of the work had been done by Space Renaissance uh, under the leadership of uh, Adriano Otino, uh, not, uh, our founder and vice president. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, Space Renaissance was very well uh, uh, okay, cited as the initiator of the proposal, which was carried by National Space uh, uh, Society. And uh, so, yes, it was a, quite a good uh, case. We have uh, heard a few uh, feedback from some of the delegation. Uh, so we have really to use the next day to work on various aspects. Some people believe that space is also already incorporated in the sustainable development goals or the, uh, uh, okay, want to define better what space for all means. And so we have a series of presentations. I will talk about how we can use space for all uh, also as an opportunity to develop capacity uh, in all countries, also in emerging countries for research. Um, and also we will talk about how you involve all the discipline and all, the, yes, all the nations, the, the rich and the, the poor as well. So we still have to do some work in the next uh, days. And of course, this is, uh, will be uh, also, uh, we'll have another milestone, but we'll have a special virtual session that uh, is organized in June. And we'll have this uh, UN summit uh, in 18 September. We'll follow some of it. Uh, there was also some uh, discussion about the legal uh, aspect of space resource utilization. And uh, there is an opportunity next year at uh, Copios to have a, uh, legal uh, subcommittee meetings on 15 of April, and we may organize a joint session where um, Space Renaissance and uh, some of the scientific community would be involved in also uh, the conversation uh, and the debate with the legal and government, also involving academia, industry, and also uh, agencies. So yes, it's still uh, some uh, past, but uh, uh, you can expect that uh, we are going to talk and work on some precursor activities uh, in the next years to come. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. Okay. Also, yeah. uh, thank you very now, much. Now, Franz, uh, can you unmute yourself? I'm afraid he is having a technical problem. Yes, he has a technical problem. Yeah. He is okay. hearing. Uh, no, okay, it's I... okay. Uh, he okay. was hearing everything uh, like with an echo. Yes, and, yes. Uh, so we were solving the problem. 
Yes, Adriano just uh, um, um, helped me. So, so this uh, Zoom uh, opened uh, uh, twice out the session in the background, and I could hear it is with a delay. So it was like a, a, a choir of. Yes, yes, yes. I can understand. Uh, can you tell us from which uh, university you got your uh, honoris causes? Causes. From the Cyrilland Methodicus University in uh, Trnavau, Turnau in the Slovakia. Ah, interesting. So it, it's quite rare for a natural scientist, at least in the uh, Hanover area. I'm the only chemist since uh, 1991. And, and uh, in 1991, uh, another professor got uh, this kind of award from a different university, but he was also the president of the German Chemical Society at that time, so so it's 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 I'm the only one here so far, <laughs> so it's yes. quite nice. But uh, uh, but it is uh, in natural science is very rare. In other fields, uh, like theology, is more common. But uh, uh, Germany is very strict on such things. Yeah. Yes, I, I know. Hmm. So I, 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 it, I feel I feel quite honored and. Uh, and uh, yeah congratulations <laughs> thank you very much yeah it's a it's it's nice it's really nice because it, i think it was the biggest party ever somebody made just for me <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice franz uh you may share your screen and uh, the floor is yours uh, we are really curious uh to listen your lecture now all right all right so i try to find the the powerpoint problem would be the best i believe so it doesn't i hope i hope i'm uh, opening uh, the right one oops what is it doing jesus can i otherwise i have to do one more try um, no, that would be the full screen. Um, Shall I help you? Soll ich dir helfen? Yeah, but I möchte eigentlich nur den PowerPoint offen. Sorry for the German. Den, also den PowerPoint, the screen öffnen. Und uh, let me see if he's doing this. Freigeben. Oh, Zoom, Zoom needs. Also, du musst eigentlich hier unten nur uh... yes, share the screen and I wanted to use the PowerPoint so it doesn't allow me to screen the full thing. Uh, let uh, me maybe see. you have to let me see give, what it... give free it, uh, Adriano. Yeah, yeah, he says, uh, yeah, he says I should, uh, uh, Jesus. He, um, okay, if. If you want to send me your presentation, I can run it for you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, you have to give him the allowance, uh, I guess. Yeah, I don't know why this, uh, this, this, this I didn't uh, have to. Hello. Uh, yes, it's quite big. Uh, if I'm not, I'm not sure if I can send it to you via your email. So more than, more than 100 megabytes. But let me see. I'm sorry for... Did not yeah, versuch noch mal das zu öffnen, einfach so. Yes. Um. Uh, so. Uh. Bildschirm teilen und. Uh. So, this is, uh, he wants me to. Um, I made you co-host, Franz. So maybe now you should have all the the okay the okay. the, the um, you know. Let me see if he allows me to. But, uh, all the uh, capabi all the capabilities. Um, ah shit. Of freigeben. Yes, yes, that's what I did. But he says I don't have the right to do this. <laughs> no, it's impossible. Yeah, I think so too. Share your screen. Share screen. The green, uh, green icon on the bottom. Yes. Box. Yes. Once, one second. I, he did it several times, Adriano. Hmm. I, I, um, I, I uh, yes. In general, I did it, uh, but uh, now, 
Well, we will find. We'll find a way. And in, in the meantime, send me your presentation via email. So if you cannot, I, I can run it for you. And you it, tell me. Next slide, please. With oh, yeah. 100 megabytes. You I can, can send it via. Uh, okay. I, can try. I can try. Yeah. We should have. You can send it uh, via WeTransfer. Yeah. With WeTransfer, can it verschicken. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let me. So I'm sorry that we have some delay here, uh, some technical problems. Uh, it's strange, but sometimes uh, technique doesn't work uh, as we we would like to do it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I would li like to give Adriano the word, uh, and he can talk about um, the, the event we have next week. Um, yes, of yes. course. And yes. what is it about? Yeah, so uh, next Monday, by the way, uh, we will have the first event of the 18 SDG uh, coalition. So we will have about 30 speakers. Uh, well, maybe they will not so, show everyone. Um, Are you yeah. ready? Yeah, I, I think he's suggesting me to... Let me see if it works. Otherwise, he's suggesting me yes, to... Yes, it okay, works. You're it sharing. works. Okay, it works. Yes. Because he and now fine. you have to put full, full screen, run yes. your presentation, and then it. Is it right. uh, yes? But okay. you have to go to the You're first in. slide. Uh, okay, yeah. you, we yeah, no, can start right. now. Oh, Jesus. Um, okay, good. Okay. Thank you. So you see my screen? Yes, we can oh, see yes. you, we can hear right. you, you All can right. start your show. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um yeah, yeah, he wanted me to uh, to to allow myself uh, and and the super user could only do this a good property. Anyway, I would like to talk about some something from Mars which I have experienced uh and uh, so I'm, I'm more or less uh, responsible for a small device, which is called MIMOS. And we have three of them on the surface of planet Mars. And um, and I'll tell some of the experiences which I've made along this time and maybe about things we want to do in the future. Maybe going to the moon or some other ideas. So. Yeah, and uh, one of the things uh, which which uh, which uh, is very exciting on the Mars is that you get uh, beside uh, the red Mars, you also get some red sky, but you get some greenish uh, blue sunsets. Yeah, and uh, so there are different things. Now here is the university. This is the castle uh, in which I'm allowed to work. It belongs to the Leibniz University. It's the chemistry building, and it is built um, in a British style because the King of Hanova was actually the King of England, starting from 1614 with King George. King George is still buried in, in Hanover, and uh, this, uh, this personal union lasted for 123 years until 1837. Um, until Queen uh, Victoria came along. So anyway, this is a beautiful castle, and uh, but the president has a nicer one, uh, as you can see. So they wanted to have this British style castle even in Germany, but the horse in the in the foreground is typical for uh, for uh, Hanover, for uh, Lower Saxony. And this horse was actually uh, used by some gentleman from Italy to use it as a logo for his cast. Uh, into Ferrari, if you have heard before. And um, so um, now the universe is named after Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and he's the one who actually invented the binary numbers and all the ways of doing calculations with it. Uh, the conversion to the left, you have the binary numbers to the right, the decadic numbers, and uh, now you we, we use them. And actually, when he wanted to publish this, uh, some... some uh, the publisher told him this is so so unimportant, so uninteresting, and uh, and he made made Leibniz uh, uh, not to publish this thing. So until he wrote it here, 
1697 in a letter and, uh, and did, did not at first publish it in, in some scientific publication. But uh, in German, he said, like, you can do everything out of nothing. And for doing this, only one is enough. Yeah. So the, the, the one and the zero, you have only two symbols uh, to uh, describe the numbers which can be used like for current or no current or five volts or zero volts, something like this. So Leibniz uh, did a lot of very important things. Also, he invented, for instance, the integral sign um, in, in Hanover. Or, or if you don't know Hanover at all, then uh, maybe there was also Mr. Herschel. Um, uh, and uh, he's, he was the one who discovered a planet from, uh, from Hanover. But also, uh, since uh, he was uh, well known, of course, in, in the UK. Um, later so um this was the original writings we still have 200,000 of this in an unesco world heritage uh, library the original writings of leibniz they survived him uh, because the king protected them uh, because he knew leibniz knew so many secrets he have to have to uh, uh, save these uh, things uh, it, it could be if they are distributed it could be not uh, the best reputation for the king um, so, uh, the logo of the university, we use the original writing of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And uh, I have a riddle, which uh, we will uh, address at the end of my presentation. I love chemistry, but uh, would I love chemistry so much that, uh, that I would use an element, or for which of the elements uh, I would, I would uh, make an artwork bigger than 100 meter? stall at least or found a society with more than 100 million members so if you know the element then let me know uh, and at the end of my talk i'll give you the answer and uh, now here let's jump to the mars and uh, the mars really when i uh, work in the, in the nasa control center then then you work uh, uh, on the mars uh, in martian times and it means that uh, 24 hours for a day is not enough. You need 24 hours and run about 40 minutes. That means if you start working today at midnight and tomorrow you start at 040 and then 120 and so on. So you refresh your chat lag every day, which makes it quite interesting. And then the number of uh, days it takes to rotate once around the sun is 365 days, is an Earth year. And on the Mars, uh, since he has a longer way to travel, it is around about doubled the numbers of Earth days. And therefore, every two years, they're passing by the Earth and the Mars, and then you can jump over from the Earth to the Mars uh, with a short period of time. And, uh, and this happens every two years. Okay, now here's a Viking uh, successful, the very first successful landing on the Mars was Viking 1 in 1976. And uh, and here they had like a, a blue sky and um, typical rocks and typical soil on the Mars. But uh, uh, the problem here is uh, it was a false color picture. So you have different filters and a black and white cameras, and then you add three of them up to get uh, a color picture. And when we do this with our eyes and the absorption is exactly what uh, we see in our eyes, then it's a true color picture. But if the absorption is at a different energy than our eyes, then it's a false color picture. And this is a typical false color picture. It looks like as if it is true, but uh, the truth is the sky is not blue on the Mars. The sky on the Mars is red. And one of the reasons is uh, here, here we have a spirit picture from 2005, one of our two rovers, very an opportunity. You see the solar panels here. You see the antennas to the left, uh, the Heiken antenna and uh, the DTE. And then you see the robotic arm with already our device mounted there. And you see the tracks in the Martian soil, which were produced when our rover was driving there. And of course you see the sky, the red sky, and uh, the reason is the Mars Mars is uh, smaller than than the Earth in diameters. Therefore, the pressure is lower. So we have a gravity constant instead of uh, nine point eighty one on Earth. We have only three point six on Mars, 
So that means the um, gravity on the surface is much lower. So the only the heavy molecules can stay and uh, carbon dioxide is uh, more much heavier than water, like double the mass. So um, with 44 grams uh, per mole, where water has only 18 grams per mole. So therefore you have a lot of carbon dioxide uh, on the, in the atmosphere and, and less water. Water is frozen on the polar region, south and uh, north polar region. But uh, uh, also it is bond to the minerals, which we, we found during our measurements. And uh, it is uh, not so much existing in the air because uh, it easily escapes to space. And um, the pressure is much lower, 100 times lower than Earth. And that means the water cannot, uh, it doesn't put so much pressure on the water molecules so that they form liquid water. So we have only get uh, gas, gas, uh, gas phase water molecules and of course frozen ones. So we have sublimation and resublimation, but we don't have melting or other things. In the minerals, of course, we can see this, but that's a different story. Now, um, here is a sunset. Uh, so this is the complementary color of the red during the day, and therefore it is so greenish blue and uh, it has a different, uh, yeah. So it uh, feels different. So it's quite like uh, complementary to the, to the earth. But uh, since there is no rain and uh, no water cycle going to, via the, going to the liquid one, it goes only from solid to gaseous and back. Uh, that's why it's uh, the rain is uh, there's no rain on Mars and there's no cleaning event uh, for for the dust in the sky and therefore we have this different situation. Now here we started uh, in uh, uh, June 2003 and three weeks later with uh, the other rover, the Mir rover A, which was called Spirit, and uh, the Mir rover B, which was called Opportunity. Actually, at first we had like the name one and two and and then. And then this, uh, the uh, people said, oh, we need better names. And then we kept, the scientists kept thinking, and then they came up with A and B. And A was the rover two, and B was the rover one. And and then the NASA boss said, no, we have to ask our uh, younger, young and intelligent, uh, talented persons. And, uh, and then there was a little girl coming up with the idea, calling it with the right spirit, we will have the opportunity. And since then, the rover A was called Spirit and B, Opportunity. And these are, uh, is in Cape Canaveral, the, in, up here is the, the rover mounted in there in this Delta II rockets. And uh, so we had some nice fly via seven months there. And um, as you can see, there are several landing sites, uh, the, like the Viking 1 and 2, then the Pathfinder 97, which was a successful test uh, mission. And then we have the opportunity in Planitia Meridiani and the Gustav Greater Spirit uh, around here, which is like, if you see like zero degree and 180, so this is like the on two opposite sides of the Mars. This is a Mercator projection map. So, so the one is on the one side on the other. So when one goes to sleep, the other one is waking up. So we could work for, well, all around the clock for 24 hours uh, and we did not have to go to sleep. We could just enjoy any time, but you know, we are humans and sometimes we need a rest. Now there is also the Curiosity rover and uh, the Perseverance rover. They are very successful. There was the Beagle rover on the three red ones. We have our device on. Beagle actually did not work uh, that well on the surface, but with Spirit and Opportunity, we got some outstanding results. And uh, this was during the landing process uh, when uh, approaching the surface. The airbags were already on, and uh, so this was like the first shot on the Mars, and then uh, the opening and, and unfolding of the whole process, and then driving off this landing site. And uh, and what we could see was really with the op uh, spirit and opportunity uh, landing site, different things, and on the opportunity side, we, we landed in the so-called Eagle Crater, and, and the minerals here in this rim 
you see the rover uh, investigating these things were exactly what we were looking for minerals uh, proving that there was water and uh, if you look with a microscopic imager you can see structures which already give some indication for water layered formation but later on we could prove nicely that it really uh, um, was based uh, on the water process and uh, you see there are different forms and structures and and you you can tell what what it means for the future so we were driving and actually the mission was scheduled for 90 days soul 90 was like our final one this was uh, our, uh, our the end of our budget uh, so to say the the ground mission the the first round and and then here you, you see already the robotic itd arm with four devices and and the landing site and the little eagle uh, crater with around about 20 meters diameter here you have a uh, bigger uh, endurance crater and and after 90 days and you have no money then uh, what do you do uh, well you die in a crater maybe but unfortunately we got some extension of the mission since we were cheap did not uh, need much money so we could continue uh, uh, driving and we did not have to die in a crater like this. And uh, actually, how does the rover look like? The Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity, you see they are like 140 centimeters tall and long. And then you have the robotic arm with four different devices, antennas uh, to send direct data to the orbiters, uh, the ultra high frequency, uh, the high gain antenna, uh, which could directly transmit data to Earth. And then this uh, DTV antenna, which could also directly uh, transmit data to Earth on a high data rate, but you need to uh, actually orient it you know, towards the Earth, which is not needed for the other one. So, uh, so 140 centimeters I just pointed out, and here there are 40 devices. This is the most power spectrometer, which I'm uh, now responsible for the APX as an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer to see elements. Here we see iron and the minerals containing irons. And here you have a rock operation tool, which, uh, which can be used to clean or drill little holes or clean the surface. And a microscopic imager to, to see such things. Here it is again, and uh, in addition, you also have some magnets here. These magnets collect the magnetic particles, and then we can measure them with our device and tell what they are. There's a sundial in the backside, and the sundial, yeah, if you want to know what we use a sundial for, then uh, um, beside the calibration targets for the colors, uh, this sundial is very useful for quite some application. If you want to know in detail, just ask me and I'll give you an answer. Um, yes, here is the, the um, cleaning tool for the surface, the, the rat, uh, as I have just explained a minute ago. But uh, no, let me now focus to the Mersbore. And the Mersbore is actually uh, something which was uh, discovered by Rudolf Mersbore during his PhD thesis in 1958. And uh, well, he found something which was awarded three years later with the Nobel Prize. And uh, what do you have to do to be awarded with a Nobel Prize for your PhD thesis? This is at least what, uh, what uh, I believe every PhD student should be interested in. And, um, and he found something uh, which was spectacular. He found a nuclear resonance absorption of gamma radiation that was similar to some such kind of resonance absorption in the in the visible energy range, so visible what visible for our eyes, so what we can see, like some red light or blue light or green light. But if you go to the nucleus, then the energies go higher. They go from the from visible to the gamma ray range. And the most striking thing is he found this recoil less. And that is really something which is uh, only pure quantum mechanically achieved. Classically, it doesn't exist because it violates, like, seems to violate Newton's third law, action is a reaction. And uh, because you shoot with a, with a um, misboard gun and you don't have a recoil. And, um, and then the emission is so precise that uh, you can actually observe relativistic effects at room temperature here and now at 
low velocities, uh, far away from the speed of light. Generally, people expect relativistic effects close to the speed of light, but here we can see them already here and now. So when we change temperature a little bit during our MOSPA experiment, we have to correct for the relativistic effects. And then we get some interaction between the nucleus and, and the the electrons, and this is the so-called hyperfine interaction, and it's it's a composition of uh, electrical magnetic composition, so electric monopoles and electric quadrupoles and uh, magnetic dipoles, but uh, whatever. Now the minerals we see only minerals when we have a cobalt fifty-seven source uh, containing the isotope iron fifty-seven, and um, so we are very precise, but we are limited to. Uh, this uh, this kind of commands, but this is uh, it's not the worst in the world. So what we have is we have some excited state, and it can decay to the from the to the ground state, emitting some gamma uh, radiation, and then this can be absorbed uh, by some other um, element, and then can lead to some emission of a gamma ray or electrons, and this we can measure to see what's going on. And if we do so, then we get only one energy, and this is like the lifetime of this iron 57 gives you the energy resolution. And if you do so, we see in comparison to the visible energy range, we are like uh, five orders of magnitude more precise. From 10 to the power of minus eight to the 10 to the power of minus 13. Now, but we only get one point, but to get more than one point, to get a real spectra out of it, we need to move uh, our source. Uh, so we use the so-called Doppler effect the one you know when a car is passing by, you know, you hear it go, ee when it goes up, then the energy goes up when it's approaching you. But if it's leaving uh, your sight, then, uh, then the energy goes down. And that's what we can use. So if we speed it up toward the targets or slow it down in the other direction, then we get uh, this energy added on top of the energy of the photon. And since the... This uh, gamma quantum is already at the speed of light. It just changes only the energy of the photon. And, uh, and that's what's going on. So for this, we have to do this. We move it, and then we get the different energies and getting instead one point, the whole spectra. The absorber is the sample. The detector is, is, is the eye which sees what's going on. Now, we can have it here, the absorber and the detector. With some electronics, we can measure this. Now, generally, the general uh, setup looks like this. It's quite uh, big, um, several square meters. But here is a handy little lovely most per spectrometer, which we use on the Mars. We could make it a little bit smaller, but this uh, quite took some, some while. And inside, you have some detectors and some drives to move the source there. The uh, nuclear source, Cobalt 57, is mounted, for instance. Okay, and uh, and then you get uh, this moving source and, and the sample, but if you cannot shoot through in transmission, then you can get the emission and detect it from this side. And generally on Mars, we don't have somebody who is preparing our sample, so we we measure in this geometry position and get some emission peaks. So and this uh, is like the robotic arm, and already the device is looking towards the sample and taking a misspoil spectra, like here on this rock. And this is a special rock because actually it's a meteorite which uh, did, uh, which was found on the Mars. And actually during our mission, we found the first of this kind. And for this, really the definition of a meteorite had to be changed because generally the standard definition is that you can only get uh, a meteorite named if you send a sample, but the transport from Mars to Earth was too expensive. So they changed the rules for us so that we can even, if we have really uh, identified the meteorite, a typical one here, iron and nickel containing one, uh, then we can get it uh, named and officially recognized, uh, we, even without uh, delivering a sample. Here. And uh, so the story of this little device started not with me, it started with Egbert Kangel, and he was a colleague of Mosbauer, of Rudolf Mosbauer, in 1990, and uh, there was uh, they were scheduled for some Russian mission to the Mars, but uh, this failed in the 90s, and then with the NASA, we have been successful. His student, Gustav Klingenhofer, continued the project, 
um, and, uh, and and now I'm the third generation heading this project. So here in the back, this is me when I was younger. This is Egbert Kankerleit in the corner, and this is Gösta, who is who was the second generation, and uh, that's the most poor team who was working on this for, yeah. Uh, a part of the team, I have to say, the ones in the in the NASA Mission Control Center, and uh, see, this is the size of this device. Here, my hair is a little bit shorter than uh, than I'm wearing it now, but uh, I think that's not a problem at all. Here uh, is uh, in the um, uh, JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratory during the mounting of the uh, device uh, and. Um, and that was actually then the big event, the very first spectra on the surface of planet Mars measured on the 7th of January in 2004, and the, very, the first extraterrestrial most bar spectra. And the big surprise was already that we could see a lot of iron too, uh, like a, a pyroxane and olivine, and then iron three. But the majority was the non-oxidized iron two, um, so 60%. And everybody expects the red, the, the, the red color from the Mars is coming from the iron three, and uh, because this is generally giving these red byproducts, but here the majority was still not iron three, um, but still this uh, the color comes from this very thin layer of iron three oxide on the surface, which can move easily while the olivine and pyroxene is uh, existing in bigger grains and bigger sizes there. Okay, now typically we can say when uh, these minerals coming from the inside, like on the earth uh, to the outside of the planet, then usually we have a core, which is a plain iron, and then it, uh, it uh, is oxidized to iron too. And when it comes out, through the volcano, then uh, it can be oxidized further on. And there are different pathways uh, depending on whether we have enough oxygen or not. If we have enough, then it directly goes to ferrihydride, hematite, goethite. If there is not enough, then you have iron 2 and iron 3 contents like green rust. And green rust also exists on Earth or lepidocrochide, macimide, and uh, this kind of thing. So we can really distinguish, we can read the geological textbooks and see what's going on. Also, we have this magnetotactica bacteria, and uh, they have little magnets inside, and these magnets, they can, um, uh, they, they, they are used by this uh, little creature to survive, to orient itself along the magnetic field of the, of the Earth. And actually, if you think we don't have such magnets in our brain, you're wrong. We do have, we have found some, we did investigate already some, and they're quite magnetic, but not that uh, big, but they're also quite small. They can be hexagonal and, and cubic, so they can have different shapes. Now, here you see already some cleaning sites on the surface, and, and then we could investigate these things at different depths. And and the striking thing was here, we found the iron oxyhydroxy compounds in the alpha structure. And this is named goethite after the German writer. And this goethite con still containing also an, an hydrogen. So so this was uh, also approved there. There it can only exist uh, being produced in liquid water. So there must have been liquid water where you find this kind of mineral. Now, here I told you about some meteorites we found. Uh, well, you have seen the very first one at the heat shield rock, but there are uh, others, uh, as you can see, and we can nicely analyze them with this uh, beautiful MOSPAR spectrometer and uh, tell what they are consisting of and what kind of names they have, like chemosite, tenite, uh, shribosite, and uh, coenite, and other things. And here comes the very, very exciting uh, result, which later gave us the Breakthrough of the Year award for, uh, celebrated by the uh, Science Magazine. And uh, here you see a magnetic feature, uh, um, magnetic phase um, there already. But here, this uh, doublet is very interesting. Let me zoom in a bit because it is uh, significant for a gerocide. And this gerocide, has iron, three iron atoms and some sulfates. 
and hydroxides, OH, and, uh, and some uh, for compensating the charge, some positive charged uh, uh, cations like sodium or potassium. And the very important thing here is that you still have, beside the oxygen, the hydrogen. And the hydrogen at higher temperature starts to move much faster. It's the lightest element in the periodic table. And when you heat it up to above 800 degrees, the same thing like in Fukushima will happen. It will leave the compound and uh, not return. So that means you get only oxides if it's heated up. So if you melt this thing, the hydrogen is definitely gone forever. And uh, since we find this thing, it means it was never heated up above 800 degrees because the hydrogen is still there. And then the only way to produce this is from a solution. And the solution uh, which is producing OH is water, the most uh, common one. And uh, so if this is made in water, then uh, with the sulfate, we can even tell that it was a uh, water in which this gerocide was grown, and the water was uh, acidic uh, with uh, uh, this sulfuric acid uh, acidic, and we can tell the pH range was between two and four. So it's like our stomach, yeah. If you treat your stomach well, uh, then uh, it has a range of two to four. It did not go uh, below two because then you would only get the iron sulfate. It did not go above four because then you will get the oxy, hydroxy already, like uh, the good type, which, which uh, was grown at higher conditions, higher pH conditions. So, so that was a real breakthrough. Nobody had this one on the list. From where it was coming from, usually, generally, it's a, it's a product uh, when uh, some pyrite is decaying, iron, sulfur compound, for instance. But anyway, now we found this one. At the same time we looked at the element, we found the biggest sulfur content. So this was in correlation with already our assumption that it is this uh, mineral. So we could nicely see from, with two different uh, um, instruments, we could confirm each other, this result. And we could publish it nicely. And, uh, um, and then we found these little berries here. And these little berries, we could also gather together and clean it and see uh, subtract it from the background. We could see this beautiful sextet, which is a hematite. And so that means they consist of alpha Fe2O3, which is the structure of hematite, the chemical composition of hematite. And um, yeah, so, um, so it's very interesting. For, for this one, there is no hydrogen in, so it's not clear whether it's made in water or made in a liquid. So it could be both. Now, uh, so generally, you've, if you have iron and if it's uh, from molten state, then you have some iron oxide and it could look like this. But if the hydrogen is in, then it can give this gerocide, which is uh, now a very useful tool to know this. And we really found this from the very first moment here at the Opportunity site and uh, Planitia Meridiani. And we found it all along the way traveling. So the whole thing must have been under the water so that we can see that Mars once was a blue planet, but no more. And what does it mean for Earth? Will this also happen on Earth and how can we avoid it? So these are very important questions and we have some ideas to answer them. So the Mars has Phobos and Deimos, two moons, and it was a blue planet, but uh, and it had a magnetic field in the past, but no more. This is gone. And uh, the sun wind, the solar wind, comes with 400 kilometers a second. And if you have no field, then uh, you really have some problems. And the moon, for instance, is hit by this. And that's why the composition of the moon is different from the Earth's composition. And we can nicely distinguish the two of them. But when the pressure goes down, then also you have the hydrosphere is gone. And what will be on Earth and how can we avoid this destiny? We'll see. But uh, now, uh, in points of our mission, we were scheduled for 90 days, but we made more than 5,000 days. And uh, that was uh, wonderful. And uh, so the spirit actually didn't last until 2010. And um, well, they had to drive on the mountainside going up the hills. So, so the electric engines on the 04 
on, on the front wheels and back wheels uh, give give some uh, uh, well um, yeah lower the duration of 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 uh, the whole uh, system but we have learned we have learned a lot from it and we used it for the opportunity side which started three weeks after and so we could last here much longer and drive much longer and avoid a lot of these problems ahead of time and for the first time we could go further than a marathon and every member got a medal for the first extraterrestrial marathon and so far uh the the distance we have managed is the longest one on the surface of any other planet and so we'll keep the record until it will be broken and this could be this could be the case uh when uh, some some other missions in the future so we believe it will it will it will be but uh, actually the the record before was by the russians on the moon and uh, yeah so uh so this is uh, um uh, also a spirit and opportunity a quick uh, comparison between the two of them and uh, we took many pictures many people liked the pictures and uh, we had a lot of fun but uh, now here is one of the things which we, we are really afraid of. These are the dust devils. And these dust devils, they can kill a rover once they hit, once they hit uh, the rover because they can have some electrical discharge to kill the electric sides of the rover. But uh, instead of killing the rover, actually they cleaned our solar panels. And that's why we could continue our mission. And it was not terminated after three months, 90 days. And we could get the continuation because the power supply was guaranteed. And that's why we renamed the dust tables to cleaning events, which was much, much more exciting for us. And, um, and then uh, here you see, uh, before the cleaning event, before the dust devil and after uh, this sundial. And uh, if you want to know, just ask me well, for what we're using this sundial for, besides having the color calibration. Uh, and uh, But you can see nicely that uh, the cleaning event really works and uh, helped us to survive. Now here you see uh, the rover before and after the cleaning event. So before and after the cleaning event. It's really nice to see. The solar panels are covered and uh, the, the conversion of light to electricity is low and it has been enhanced and it enables us to continue the mission. This is a selfie made by the rover itself. That's why it looks a little strange. So all these little pictures were stitched together, but it's, I believe it really looks like a nice selfie. Uh, but it's not a regular selfie. Uh, it's more like more difficult so now um actually we have to do a break dance on the mars and uh, this break dance looks like it's always moving aside and so on if you know why we did uh, if you want to know why we did the break dance we didn't do it at the beginning but after a while we we, we had to then i'll give you the answer and so but uh, it was, uh, I can tell, not for uh, doing some dense training. It was for some higher purpose, scientific purpose. Now, this is Gerster during the first, very first uh, um, um, presentation of uh, Mersboa Spectra on Mars with Steve Squires, the scientific boss of the mission. So he presented the very first spectra of the uh, Spirit rover and uh, and actually... Here is Rudolf Mersbauer. He passed away in 2011, but at that time he was still excited. And we were at that time flying to the to the Mars and uh, he was afraid that, that the method is so sensitive, maybe it will not work. And really during the fly, we had problems. We, we, got, uh, we had a checkout on the fly and, and that uh, showed that our line was so much broadened and everybody thought like, oh Jesus, Maybe it was damaged during the takeoff, uh, too much cheese on the drive and so on. But uh, but after landing, everything was fine because there was there were some other issues which we could which we could resolve. And he said, uh, "It's so sensitive. I'm afraid it will not work, but I hope I'm wrong." And I can tell he was right. He was wrong. So so his wish became true. He was wrong. 
and um, and it worked very well on the surface of planet Mars. After landing, we could take the very first beautiful spectra. And here I was uh, in the beautiful situation to present the very first spectra of the Opportunity rover, also with Steve Squires here. And I could see already the magnetic parts and uh, pyroxene and the olivine. So you see like this, uh, this kind of olivine is like an iron two. Uh, silicate and, and if it's grown very nicely that's called a peridot which was like the favorite stone of uh, Cleopatra and Cleopatra was the ancient queen of Egypt but uh, but you know she had some migration background because actually she was uh, a Ptolemyan so uh, descended from Alexander the Great uh, who was uh, like uh, you know coming from Macedonia so some people say he was Greek he was fighting for the Greek, but uh, maybe he was Albanian. But you know, this. Uh, but uh, whatever he did, uh, his job uh, and he did something. And uh, so history is difficult, but uh, usually you need many bright minds to get something going. And um, but uh, if you want to know for cheap and see it, then take a green wine bottle. Then this is more or less the color of the olivine when the iron two is giving is working as a pigment in there and the iron three uh the iron three silicate which you can see here is actually brownish and if you want to have a free preview then take a brown beer bottle and then you know how it looks like um so in a way okay now um here we could nicely publish these things and uh you're, here you see the tracks again, and uh, so Al Gore, he was coming, and uh, um, I could shake his hand here, and uh, he signed the bills for our mission, so we, uh, I was quite thankful to him that he did that, and he was really interested also in the scientific results, so that is, that is really um, exciting. Uh, yeah, and now this uh, device uh, was also used for other things, like uh, some nice picture here on Earth. And this was like a cover page of some German newspaper. And there was a picture which said to be made by some famous artist. And this artist did also this picture and uh, that picture. And uh, the young lady was once the most expensive picture ever on auction at least for a while, and his name was Gustav Klimt, or Gustavo Klimt too, in Japanese, which uh, was auctioned for more than 100 million euros, and at that time it was the most expensive picture ever on auction, or Hyaku Yonchu Roku Oku En in Japanese, if you want to know that, uh, if not, then just forget it, um, and, um, and actually now it's a Da Vinci with more than 400 millions, but still Gustav Klimt is in the in the in the top league uh, for this kind of pictures and if they would auction the kiss which is still in vienna and the belvedere if you ever have a chance don't miss it in the upper elevator you will find it in a special room uh, then this one will probably also bring a lot of money but the republic of austria will probably not put it on auction and uh, and and here we go. Then uh, we have this this other picture, uh, this trumpeting Buddha, and some people thought maybe it could be a Klimt or maybe not. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we tried uh, and we measured. And we found there are several layers, and uh, we were just writing a book on on that. And uh, we found really some signatures which indicate uh, uh, Klimt heritage, and, um, and there were some actually some. Uh, news uh, like in the uh, TV station uh, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria. But uh, this part is in Germany. If someone is interested, I can play it at the end of the presentation. But uh, for now, I would like to uh, uh, just uh, tell you. So Lange galt der trompetende Puto als the, verschollen, gar Oops, yeah. Can I, can I jump a little bit? Bist yeah, so um, so actually, uh, some so we could uh, help with our device. We could tell, uh, restore some uh, important artwork. So the top layer is really new; it's not clean. So somebody overpainted this thing, and the layer below really fits to the to the time of Klimt to around eighteen eighty den ein Sammler wiedergefunden hat, abgestellt in einer Garage in Österreich. Doch ist es wirklich der verschorbene Klimt? 
Nachdem in Hannover schon das Landeskriminalamt die Spuren der Echtheit des Gemäldes ist, wird es jetzt an der Johannes Gutenberg Universität Mainz sogar mit neuster Weltraumtechnik analysiert. Klingt abenteuerlich und ist es auch. So, I cannot jump. Kollege Jochen so. Werner weiß mehr. Repeat, what was that? I found a flint. A Gustav flint. Ein Bild von Gustav Klemmt. So, so you see a picture no, yeah, on the Mars, but this was a little bit more uh, fiction. So here on the lab, we could uh, do the measurements, and you see already we had some partial restoration already on this side. And the whole PGC says it's devoted to just this investigation of that. Tja, also and, letztlich glauben, im Prinzip machen die Spektrometer auf dem Mars und hier das Gleiche. Sie sehen bitte. Ja, yeah. so let me jump over and uh, so this work is still ongoing, but it's very exciting and some people say it. now, now our technique is useful because it's used for art. Now, here was actually uh, some Japanese interest because we also did some measurements in Japan and that was uh, uh, Japanese journal and um, and we uh, were featured with some investigations on this and um, so so it was became really a worldwide story now there's a different story you can also go with this kind of device to the to the parliament so we went to the parliament and we could use uh, it here and show um, that this field actually contains some roman origins as you see this young uh, a fellow and we published some book uh, about uh, the artifacts found on this on this field but still like there were some people from the authority said no this is non no roman origin and in the textbooks now it's written that the romans have never been to uh, this part of lower saxony so but uh, now we find even coins of roman origin and the history of this city could be extended for more than to more than 2000 years um and um, and therefore we were i was invited to the parliament with the cloud device and to give some statement so so you can go quite a long way with such uh, a thing and of course we try to have some more things to be done in the future so one thing is like uh, international lunar research uh, station uh, as a member of the international lunar research team so on the moon, uh, this should be in the so South Polar region. Uh, and uh, now the things uh, with the Artemis mission are, are going on to see what could be a possible landing site. And uh, and uh, there are less than 20 possibilities now, or, or let's say, um, and it will be, of course, uh, further reduced. The German is Air, Air, and, um, Air and Space Agency supporting us with some in-situ research utilization things uh, to have such projects like for the moon to see what we could use on the moon and the European Space Agency also for this moon station and the NASA of course is also in, in, in this for the moon and the Mars or there was a mission to Ceres uh, the biggest problem is usually the funding so if you have no funding you don't have so much fun uh, there's also a Chinese and Roscosmos, but now Roscosmos is not so popular anymore. Um, and um, therefore, we are, we are uh, restricted uh, to other things. Then JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency with the Hayabusa, the sample return from the asteroids, which is very exciting, uh, Hayabusa 1 and 2. And uh, the Canadians. So, so we'll see. We'll see where we can use it. But uh, one thing is clear: we want to go back for the first time to the moon with our device. We have investigated already some moon samples from the Apollo mission and other things, but this could be quite exciting. Now, here is uh, our former president, and uh, there is me shaking hands with the students 
and uh, showing them. And you see, this is quite some dynamic thing since I also love some Japanese martial arts style. But if you think I do it only this way and we have no symmetry here, we are, you see me upside down and the student is shaking my hands and uh, turning me. And I even kept speaking during the rotation in the air. So um, you see the headset connection. It's a wife actually, to be honest. So I teach also these things and uh, my nickname is associated to the iron so but the students uh, like that that's why this is the uh, the metal and uh, the lost metal but before the second world war uh, the iron was uh, named the king of the metals yeah but so but this is the modern writing of this and uh, so iron is uh, very popular on that and here i got an honorary phd award and the whole party was just for me and I thank you very, very much. And um, um, so this was some appreciation which you don't get every day. So now uh, I had no chance to have to interact with uh, some of you. Uh, so the question is whether you know what is the element for which you would make an artwork bigger than 100 meters or found a society with more than 100 million members. And I can tell you the answer is Iron, iron, it's iron, and this is the artwork, and it's actually the uh, the smallest unit uh, cell for the structure of iron at room temperature, the alpha iron. It's uh, um, a, cu a cubic uh, structure, which is a body centered uh, cubic structure, and uh, and actually it's called the Atomium. It's in Brussels, the headquarters of the European Union, and uh, the society is the European Union. And uh, this was, uh, you know, after the First World War, there was some attempt to avoid a further war, but it failed because the second one came. And then um, and then the focal point was changed to the United Nations, but the United Nations still cannot prevent another war. But for the European community, I have to say, it is the longest period of peace in Europe ever. So there were many wars in the history of Europe, but now since the... European uh, Union was founded, uh, it stopped. And one of the reasons is to control the element of iron and iron and carbon give steel. And uh, this is the main material producing weapons and they have no iron, no weapons, no war. And it worked really in Europe for a very long time now, the longest one in history. And I wish we could extend it to other places uh, um, like uh, close to the European community. And uh, I hope that it will be continued here. Still, there are some uh, other people who have different things in mind, but if the bad boys don't have weapons, they cannot do bad things. But of course, if the good guys are attacked from bad ones, what can they do? Yeah. So, um, so the European community um, is the model we are facing here in, in Europe, even if some people say it, they would, uh, they don't uh, like it. But for us, it is simply as a matter of fact, the longest period of peace in Europe. And I think I'm very happy about that. Now, uh, with this, I want to say thanks. Uh, this uh, is, uh, is uh, from... Uh, Arigato, Japanese, thanks in English and, and danke. And this is in Bulgaria, uh, which I've been recently. And uh, Inunom Namaiwa, the name of this dog is Ferro Einstein. It's my dog. He was born in 2005 and unfortunately he has moved on already. But uh, he was born in the famous year of Einstein. That's why he got uh, Einstein as a second name beside the Ferro. And this is my group. And... Uh, yeah, some at least is some old pictures now. The uh, the, the people have changed uh, a bit, but um, yeah. But with this, I want to say thank you to all of you, and I hope for your questions. Thank you so much for this interesting lecture, Franz. Uh, it was really, really, very interesting, and uh, I'm thrilled. Um, yeah, by this lot of information and um, yeah, uh, I would like to start with the, to take, uh, with taking the questions from the chat. 
Um, I also have some questions uh, I would like to discuss with you in Brandenburg. I hope to see you there. <laughs> In this email, Pleasure. because I I, uh, I got an idea for an art project. I, I have it since a while, but I think you are the right person. I can, can talk about this uh, so in November. So the first question is uh, from... So uh, I wanted to say that we have people watching from South Africa, oh. from Norway, from uh, the southern part of Germany, and... Um, yeah, and uh, Jay Lambert uh, is asking, is the MIMOS uh, the only spectrometer on the current mass robotic vehicles, or are there others also? Oh, there are there are other other um, uh, methods. Uh, Sorry, could, could you stop sharing, please? Could you stop? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sharing the screen. It's just a question if somebody wants needs my slides uh, or wants to see the slides, but no, okay. then we can then we can rechat the screen. Okay, okay, okay. I hope you will not have again problems with this. So how, how do you stop sharing, by the way? Can you tell me how I stop the sharing? Uh, you yeah. should have a red button in, in, on, on the bottom. Ah, Freigabe stoppen. Oh, yes. Yeah, now yeah, now. Thank you very much. So <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Good. Okay. Okay. You know, uh, shall I repeat the question uh, or you have it? Yes, uh, there are mind? other instruments. The answer is there are other instruments. There are several um, uh, different um, and uh, different types of spectroscopy like uh, Raman and so on. And so as soon as uh, it is possible to miniaturize a device, then then it is uh, used. Like, but um, uh, the and there are various types of spectroscopy. And I think it's a little bit... Uh, Tough to mention them all, but uh, like the vibrational parts. So we had uh, like uh, some Raman spectrometer on the list, which gives you the vibration of uh, uh, two different elements along the bond length, changing polarization or not, um, is infrared or Raman. And um, and then you have uh, so various, various types. Uh, but the, the big challenge is, of course, to miniaturize it and that it will still work in a proper way. Uh, because the challenges on on the surface of a different planet is that you are restricted by every possible condition you can imagine, and this makes it hard to get a, lo a lot of results. But our method was very successful because it could look uh, below the 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 top layer of the surface, and uh, and this gave us uh, some better information because. Uh, you you don't have a clean room on on the Mars uh, or on on the Moon, um, so you always have some contamination and how how your method can deal with this. Yeah, the answer is many. There are many methods uh, which uh, so as soon as it is possible to miniaturize a method, it uh, there is an attempt to try it in space. So people are very excited. So I'm happy we have uh, a, a lovely device. And we have already some possible ways of extending it with new methods. Uh, so some other additional features you, you would say nowadays. But uh, computers are getting so fast, uh, so much better that uh, this is, is a possible way. But usually you also need a lot of money for this kind of developments. And uh, if you do it uh, from a university perspective, then there is no business money in here. Yeah. Um, we are not, uh, we cannot compete with uh, Elon Musk. So, so he no connections more... with him? <laughs> oh, I never met him actually, uh, but uh, he's certainly done a lot of, of great things. Uh, yes, yes. I as you can see. So, uh, this is definitely give a lot of stimulations for, for, for many, many things. And, uh, well, well, it uh, you can see really in in parts really changed the world really for uh, for really um, bringing down the costs to go to space. Uh, I agree with you. It's true. Yeah. It's, uh, I really agree with you. And I hope it's, he's doing a nice job uh, on landing uh, from the gateway to the to the moon. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Back because he did win this competition. So congratulations. Uh, here's another question. Um, maybe this answer. Uh, um, how is the spectrometer? Uh, how is a spectrometer sample typically physically taken? What range from the sample, and how many seconds time to take to take a sample reading? 
Uh, well, this depends on the sample. Usually it takes us uh, quite some time. Uh, so if it um, um, if you have uh, best conditions, you can get the spectra within seconds, but usually uh, you 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 need uh, minutes or hours. And if it's really uh, worse, then it can be days or months. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, but uh, it, so it depends on uh, really the composition of the sample, the concentration of uh, of the uh, different components. So it is there's a big variety. But once we get a nice result, then really we can rely on it because it is isotope uh, selective and very precise. And then uh, it is not disturbed by many other, um, yeah, let's say disturbing signals like in other methods. Like when you have some uh, vibrations, you get a lot of signals from many things. And the question is, who is who? But usually we know, and then we can trust the results. Yeah, and uh, he also is asking, will France be working on our in, on or advising future space exploration projects or what uh, is he now focusing on uh, in these fields in the next years? Okay, the moon, uh, but are yeah. there other projects more? Oh, yeah, well, uh, you know, there are some ideas to go to the moon. There are other ideas to go to the Mars. So either with some rover or some flying object, like, you know, the ingenuity, uh, the, the helicopter, so there, there are some ideas of having a hexacopter, for instance, like a, a big uh, flying unit uh, with some devices on. And ours, our device is uh, low in weight, and therefore it has some advantages in this way. So we already have some some uh, test facility with some, some uh, um, drone, uh, some hexacopter, and to fly our device to different places and take spectra. So that is uh, quite exciting. So we are ready for this, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll have to see what's what's coming up. And of course, then the station on the moon on the South Polar region, and um, so there. This is this is uh, this is some of the things. Or or another um, object is like to go to the moon and doing some in in situ research utilization uh, projects, uh, which could be. For some people, they think about uh, commercializing this kind of things. But uh, uh, let's see, let's see what we can do. But these are some of the projects we are working on. But uh, there are no plans to go to uh, Venus or to Saturn or Saturn uh, moons uh, or something um, like this? Uh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, there are some plans to Venus. Actually, there were some Russian plans, but these they are on ice right now. Um, the, the Venus the, and the, ice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, it's quite too hot on the Venus actually to talk about. Uh, no, but now this uh, this uh, this missions. Uh, so everything. Um, 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 yeah, there were some plans uh, with the Russians, so we had uh, some collaborations, but right now we cannot continue them for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, there is also a uh, uh, JAXA ESA joint mission towards uh, Beppo Colombo, for instance, uh, to the to the Merkur. Our device is not on, but still we have uh, done some uh, measurements on the samples. And when the sample return, which are not collected on the Mars, are coming back, also we will study them here. As we now can study the, the Hayabusa samples, which have been returned with the Japanese uh, space mission, the first samples from these asteroids uh, brought back to Earth. So we are very interested in these kind of things, to learn new things about them and, uh, and find out uh, what's going on up there. So, so it's uh, of course the main target is to learn something new. What I liked was also that you mentioned uh, how the technique uh, was used uh, on Earth because it is. Um, I, I think it is very important to have this examples because people think always or very often you have this argument 
um, yeah, why we spend so much money for space and space research, and uh, when they see oh, on Earth it is helping too, like uh, we have seen in this picture from uh, Gustav Klimt. Um, so are there other um, projects or other uh, Anwendung, uh, <laughs> applications, yes, applications, yes, yes uh, for, from your work and uh, on Earth. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we have, we have. Actually, it's quite uh, exciting. So, so to to have to contribute a little bit to such an, an outstanding artist, you know, he, he changed uh, with his ideas, with his creativity. He changed a lot of minds. He inspired a lot of people on Earth, and I uh, really, I really liked that very much. So, so Gustav Klimt was certainly an outstanding. Person, we 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 did study also some other artists, so we have some ongoing work on these things. But you know, our financial uh, constraints are uh, so we can only do this, uh, uh, and it takes more time. So we don't have a business interest to put a lot of money, and then we could speed up things. Um, but also, we work on some storage system for hydrogen, uh, which uh, can be used like for the moon station. There's one possibility because it would have some advantages, but in comparison to the solution which is favored right now or um we uh, recently in germany decided to switch off our nuclear power plants and and we're searching for some deposit uh, place for the nuclear waste and it turned out that our little device is very useful in the search for this because the containers are made of steel or casted iron and 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 then when you put them into the mountain, you have some filler um, to to seal it uh, that there is no space between the container and the mountain, and and then the radiation coming out uh, starts some reactions, and you have to know what's going on. And with our device, we could very well understand and learn about new reactions going on there, and um, so it was. Uh, we're very happy so that we found some other direct applications and um, other applications would be like catalysis to produce new molecules uh, produce uh, or watch some reactions going on and um, so there are many things from arts uh, to science and um, I'm very excited about all this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Adriano, you have some yeah. questions too. <laughs> yes, yes. It's my time to come up with some odd considerations and then uh, with the fundamental question to be made to uh, a chemical uh, scientist. So first, the consideration, uh, thinking about the colors of Mars, it came to my mind, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, and his uh, three beautiful uh, uh, novels that are titled Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. And this is, is a, a trilogy uh, of the colonization of Mars, uh, and uh, in, the, in the beginning, Mars was red, and the... the, the um, yeah, there, there are several. So this is the this is the history of how the chemistry can influence the social history, because uh, uh, of course there are uh, the, the, the the main uh, trend that wants to 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 green Mars to to get vegetable life and to terraform uh, Mars etc. But the the uh, the conservative environmentalist oppose that. So the the environment the environmentalist in the in the Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, Robinson uh, novel are not green they are red because they want to keep Mars red as it is okay <laughs> then uh, the terraforming of course go ahead and uh, so vegetable life uh, grow up and uh, there is more oxygen in the air and. Uh, and at the end, the blue Mars, uh, the, there will be ocean, oceans on uh, on Mars, and this is a, a very interesting. I, I think is the best work made by Kim Stanley Robinson because it's a social history of a possible evolution of a society on Mars and so on. But this leads me to to the main question that I want to pose to you because you are a scientist. Uh, uh, 
working with chemistry and in your opinion it is possible from the chemistry point of view to terraform mars it will be possible to make vegetable life to encourage vegetable some kind of i don't know which kind of essences but however to encourage a, a, a green environment on, uh, on mars and then to get more oxygen and so on and if yes how long could it take in terms of uh, uh, years or centuries or or what is the the time distance that we can imagine for that well the uh, may, answer... I, may i add a second question regarding this because you were talking about uh, earth and the magnetic field and uh, how we can avoid that the mag magnetic field is um, gone from yeah. earth so uh, it's related to this uh, yeah Maybe you can yes. combine. Yes, actually, the actually, uh, the solar wind uh, is very toxic for us because when once yeah. it hits us, then it it it, it is, and and uh, speaking about the moon, the, the the Earth moon, it is much more dangerous than the Mars because it never had a magnetic field that strong. It had a small magnetic field, but uh, now no more. And the Mars has now no magnetic field, but it did have one in the past. Um, and 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 the, and really, we can tell, you know, there were volcanoes, and and there was the magnetic field, and and then when the volcanoes stop, also the magnetic field stops. And the good question is, what did stop first on the Mars? And we can tell now which one it was, because uh, when when you have some volcano eruption, you get a lava, and if the lava is uh, solidified under the influence of a magnetic field, the magnetic particles are oriented in some directions. So you know there was a magnetic field during this lava field was cooling down, getting solidified. But then there's one field on Mars which is not magnetically oriented. So it must have been after the magnetic field was already switched off or stopped, has stopped. And how is it produced, that magnetic field? So you can imagine it like a dynamo in, on, the, on the bicycle, this, these old ways of producing some, by induction, some some uh, magnetic, some electricity. Uh, so if you need a solid nucleus, then a liquid phase and outside a solid one. And if it's uh, rotating, then you have a, a relative uh, a movement and this can create this kind of field uh, and to, and when it's cooling down then uh, this relative movement is not possible anymore and it stops so so with um, so the volcanoes are connected to the magnetic field at least in one hypothesis there may be others uh, and uh, but this is one which is very likely and um, so the the point is now um what uh, what was going on on the Mars and uh, and it was um, and and how could we reach uh, the situation that you get liquid water for liquid water you need a higher pressure now we have 10 millibars and on Earth we have like one bar and it means we need a much higher pressure on the Mars but in the past there was liquid water so how was the pressure higher on the surface usually this deep depends on the gravity constant, but this depends on the mass, but the mass did not change very much. Um, so who increased the pressure in the Martian atmosphere? And one answer is volcanoes. They blow out a lot of stuff and this increases the pressure. If someone blows in my face, it also increases the pressure on my face because it's like impulses per area and that is pressure. So, um, um, yeah. So what can we do now? Um, we should, in order to get it, uh, to get this kind of terraforming, you should increase the pressure. So which means either we start our artificial volcanoes or we heat up the Mars, and then this could be possible. Or of course we cover it and make some pressure chambers. Yeah, you know, as you as you have seen in, in various movies. Yeah. You know. And um, but uh, yeah, there is some possibility, so it can be done since it was there in the past. But the gravity um, to get up the gravity from 3.6 to 9.81, as we are used on an Earth, will be difficult. But people on the International Space Station also live on low gravity, so so if they can do it, maybe we can do it. 
but for the on the long run it is not enough for us to survive because because our muscles shrink and, and then we we have bigger problems yeah uh, so so the gravity is important to keep us alive yeah to train our muscles day and night uh, so uh, so there are some some issues so at least if um, we 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 should increase the mass to get the same thing but then if we increase the mass dramatically it could also change the orbit and if you change the orbit it changes the energy so there are a lot of problems going on so um, at least uh, um, making chambers and uh, means we can create some some surroundings which uh, which gives a habitat to live on uh, on the moon for instance uh, the moon is really much more dangerous because the temperatures between day and night uh, are much bigger on the moon than than on the mars so on the on the mars you you have like 100 150 degrees but on the moon it's more like, more like 300 and more so so we should never forget this is uh, this is uh, this is really uh, also the moon is so close yeah we can go there like for uh, for a week's trip and back yeah um as as it has been done for the apollo missions and um, but therefore they selected the south polar region because there is not too much sun shining in once you get the full sunshine in your face on the moon then it gets really hot because the the moon's day takes 14 earth days and the night well, you are confirming you are confirming somehow our you know we are discussing in our committees in the in the in the space race academy committees uh, on the habitats uh, space habitats and uh, industrial and so on uh, we have a uh, let let me say not a, a determined position but i i think many of us think that it would be better to work on the moon and of mars surface but for living, it's better to build on a rotating habitats. So we can have a 1G gravity, we can uh, shield us from the, the, the radiation, the cosmic radiation and all these kind of things. So, so uh, on a is, is a better model for, for, mm. for habitation. And then people can go down to, to, to the moon and to Mars surface because Mars is, could be very important uh, for mining, for a lot of activities as a logistic pole in the middle uh, between the internal solar system and the external toward the Jupiter moons and so mm -hmm. on. So Mars is a, a, a strategic pole, but we have to understand if the, the dream of Elon Musk to, to, to build uh, cities on, on, on Mars uh, is the best uh, goal to to push, to to target, or it will maybe better to to build uh, on air infrastructures in, in Mars orbit. Mm. Uh, yes, um, yes. This uh, the orbit, of course, has uh, has the advantages with the gravity, as you just said. Yeah, but uh, if you think about like the ISS, then uh, the radiation level on the International Space Station is, of course, much higher than. Yes. Than on the surface, so, so we, we so yes, so we have an to, average two hundred millibar is round about. Yes, two hundred millibar is round about. Uh, excuse me, two hundred millicuri is uh, is uh, no. Excuse me, two hundred millisievert. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, yeah, <laughs> before changing the units too much. <laughs> I'm sorry. Two hundred millisievert uh, is round about uh, uh, what you accumulate during one year on the ISS. And on Earth, usually, so if I think about Hanover, we um, uh, we get uh, like uh, one millisievert, but then you, we have some radiation investigation and uh, we do other things. So usually we consume something around four millisievert on the surface. If we fly too much with airplanes, uh, then, then it's, of course, higher, much higher. Uh, if we fly over the poles, it's even, even worse, yeah one order of magnitude higher it it can be so but uh but if you go to the mountains also it is raised uh yeah it's, it's and I'm more, of course yes uh you know Victor the more has, you go distant from earth yeah 
the, the more of the it's, radiation. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not coming only from, from the Earth, it's coming from space. And Victor has got the yes. Nobel Prize for discovering yeah. this. Um, yeah. And, um, but uh, on the other hand, um, um, there are some cities uh, on Earth which have naturally 300 millibars, which are the highest uh, we can imagine. So people, well, no, there are not too many people living there, so we don't have good statistics on, on the surviving rate. But uh, uh, there are some places which have naturally higher radioactivity. Yeah? Or if you go to the northern lights and southern lights, the aurora borealis, aurora australis, then you also experience to some high reactivity yeah so so i just a few days ago i watched uh, the nuclear reactor uh, some research reactor we had here in the world between me and the rods like uh, just a few meters of water yeah and you can watch them nicely but you know the water is shielding all the things so you don't have to be yeah. afraid yeah. and you can measure every time whether something is coming or not so yeah, so, so that's why we, we think that we need an 18 SDG, a sustainable development goal, because these problems, the protection from cosmic radiation, the simulated gravity, don't have the proper uh, priority so far, because the paradigm was exploration, not settlement. Now, if we think really to expand into space and to go there to live and work, we need to face these two problems that are cosmic radiations and simulated gravity. That's why we need more attention on space and uh, the 17 SDGs are not enough. We need an 18th one that focusing on space, on the problems that we have to, to, to face because now everybody wants to go to the moon. The government understood the, the importance of the moon as a strategic uh, point from the astropolitical point of view, you know. But everybody, not everybody, but the powers are just thinking in terms of military because they want to send uh, soldiers over there. And soldiers are expendable. So they are life, they take radiation. It's okay, they are soldiers. No, they're not soldiers. They are boys, 20 years old. We grow yeah. to them very carefully, paying the dentistry and uh, giving vitamins. And then we send them outside to die. Ah, this is crazy. So we have to face the biological problems of our set space settlement. Otherwise, we are not serious. We are just playing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And this is our mm -hmm. conviction. We are very, very, and uh, I'm very happy that today we presented the, the proposal for an 18 SDG to the UN COPWOS in Vienna. So this is a first, a first step, a first step. And we have to go ahead on this uh, uh, on this road, and uh, we need universities to 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 join this campaign. We have thirty space advocacy organizations now that committed to support this uh, proposal. We need universities, so this is a call. <laughs> I can't you know what it means, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is is an opportunity. I took this opportunity to 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 make a call because I'm talking with a professor that uh, you are working in universities and maybe you can influence somebody and make bring our proposal to them. And uh, yes, we need universities to to join us. And okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm back, I'm, back to the point. <laughs> I'm, I'm allowed to do many things, uh, uh, especially in my own research. But when it comes to some political statements, it is difficult. So yeah, if course. I can measure something, uh, then I can publish uh, these things and I can freely talk about it. But uh, some interpretations which lead to uh, some other areas outside of my field is difficult. Yeah. And then I, yeah. I have to... Um, and, and uh, I have to uh, consider some some of these constraints, but yes. uh, we, you, are you we are prepared to that. Yes, I can, I, I I can do a lot, that. but not everything. <laughs> yes. yes. However, I will send you an invitation uh, with the prayer to forward it to to the the director of the universities or yeah, yeah. The authority to consider uh, to join uh, this campaign. That's very very important. Okay. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, However, thank you very much. I didn't thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, your lecture, that's really fantastic. Uh, as, yeah. a, as many of our lectures are very, very interesting and uh, allow us to learn something more. Yeah. Because, you know, we are, we are going uh, to, we, with our goals and so on, but we also need to learn a lot more. So thank you very much uh, um, for your, your lecture. Yes. We hope we can have an order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also would like to thank you very, very much for this interesting lecture to have you here. I thought it was really nice. And uh, I hope um, when you have your mission to the moon that we can invite you again um, for another lecture because it will be always interesting and you are also invited to join us, uh, to join SRI, but also to join uh, our webinar series. Um, we hold this webinar series um, every second Monday, um, so the, every first and third Monday at month. And um, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the 19th of June. Uh, Asa Woods will talk about cislunar energy synergies. And he's an artist uh, dedicated to space art. Uh, he also had some uh, space object uh, in the space station. So um, we try to find here a mixture uh, between art and science and philosophy uh, and this all space related topics. Yeah, Franz, it was really, really great to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, yeah, for me, it's also, uh, you know, I, I, I get, uh, I had the chance to get a lot of beautiful experiences and, uh, but to share them is, uh, is something which is, uh, which, uh, which is an additional bonus. Uh, you know, we, we always have to think like Panem et Cicensis. Yeah. So, so we have to, the, 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 like in old Roma, it was said, so we get the food from the, from the government, so we have to uh, also present something to the public uh, to give back, to show what we have done. And uh, so one day when I was explaining to like a group, thousands of young kids, uh, then I, I said, I touched with my hand this device and now it's up there. And then after my lecture, like there were like hundreds of hands <laughs> in my direction. And I said, oh, what do you want? The signature or something or a stamp? And they said, no, I just want to touch the hand which has touched this device. It's so, so sweet, yeah. <laughs> it was so exciting. I was I was I was so excited. It was so wonderful. Yeah. All yeah. These, these kids, so they got the spirit, and I don't know how many of them will will really do something and and it's it's true uh, you know in my family i'm like a 20 fold uncle and already a six fold grand uncle and and some of these uh, little fellows they are like grown up in the meantime and and then um and then i could see like they're turning into science and and follow like some footsteps and and i can uh, still like support them and uh and uh, to, or to see some some young people who who are like having new dreams, yeah. Mm -hmm. So life goes on, and um, yeah, and I like it. So we never know uh, when we do something what will be the consequence. But I I think uh, if we do it in a in a good matter, then it we uh, we improve the number of good things in in the world. And unfortunately, nowadays, you know. There are many ways of lying, uh, more ways than, than telling the truth. And that's why the lie is distributed uh, in, in an um, entrop yeah. in, in entropy favored way. So, so we can understand scientifically why the lie like is. Like a fake money, you know, like a fake money. Yes. Mm. So, so yeah. the, the lie is distributing much faster. It's entropy mm. driven, as we say in thermodynamics. So really, mm. there is a driving force for the lie to be distributed. And we have to fight it uh, with uh, with all our our means because mm. now it's, it's yeah. everything has has two, every metal has two sides. And yes. uh, we see it now with uh, AI. And uh, it has many advantages, and but also there are disadvantages, uh, and uh, it can be misused uh, and programmed in the wrong way. And 
So yeah, we have to be careful and uh, take responsibility and uh, when we develop things and which direction uh, it goes yeah. and uh, how we do it. And um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Fra Professor Franz Renz. And uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, I hope to see you soon. And uh, thank you, Adriano, for joining me, for uh, being my co host. And um, yeah, thank you to our audience for joining us it's such a long time. And um, oh, Jesus, wow. Yeah, but uh, yeah, this is usual here uh, and because we want to take time. This is the purpose of this webinar that the speaker has one hour time to present the topic that we listen to each other, that we discuss to each other, that we can ask questions to understand, to learn. And yeah, as I told you, next week we will have Arthur Woods, uh, an artist. And uh, I'm glad to have him here. And uh, thank you again, Franz, for being with and us. Thank you, and Sabine, for your fantastic content. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, to, yeah. thanks to the both of you, because it was very nice and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice evening. Okay. Thank you.